Welcome back to People Analytics in Excel Employee Attrition. In the last video, we went through the obtain step of the awesome framework where we got all of our data and we set up our analytic environment in Excel with the appropriate add-ins to do the modeling that we're going to do in the next step, in the next video. Today, we're going to work on step two and three of this process. So we're going to scrub the data and simultaneously explore it. Now, these are separate steps in the awesome framework, uh, which is good for understanding the importance of them individually, but uh, from a practical perspective, it's very difficult to scrub the data separately from exploring it. When you're looking for outliers or or unnecessary constants in your data or, or issues with the data, you're often going to be visualizing the data in order to identify those issues. So you're often exploring as you scrub. So the typical thing that I do when I'm going through this process is I go data point by data point and so here's our data set right here I go column by column or feature by feature whatever you uh, call it whatever you choose to call it and I try to get an understanding of each column individually each variable individually and then I look at relationships between them a little bit so this is likely to be the longest video in this series just because we're doing two steps and because uh, data cleaning and visualization are often rather time consuming. Now, I'd like to make the point here, I'm using Microsoft Excel 365, which is the most updated version of the program, and there are some features in here that you will not have if you're using 2013 or an earlier version. So I'm going to attempt to show you how to accomplish the same thing in the earlier versions. I won't be able to do that for everything, uh, so follow along the best you can. And don't fret if you're missing a function or, or a plot that I'm doing here because you're in an earlier version of Excel. All right, so the first thing I always want to do when I'm in Excel and I'm going through a data set like this is I want to convert it to a table. Uh, converting a data set to a table in Excel gives you access to a whole bunch of new and highly useful features. And I just want to demonstrate some of those real quick. Okay, so I'm going to hold down the control key and I'm going to press T. So control T and notice now that my data is selected and this checkbox here saying my table has headers is checked. That's appropriate because I do have headers. If I didn't have headers, I would uncheck it. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK. Now the table tools design tab comes up. So I'm going to name my table up here. So I'm going to name it table underscore data. And this is just a convention that I like to use. I'm going to hit the tab key to tab out of there. Now, let's just talk about tables real quick. There's a number of interesting things you can do with tables. Uh, one of the mo one of the interesting features is that I have the ability to click this total row here, and now I come down here and you can see a total row has been added at the end of my data set. So I have 1,470 observations plus the row for the column headers. So now if, if I want to come down here and I want to total distance from home. I can click under here, go to the drop down, and now I have a whole bunch of options here. So if I want to see what the standard deviation is on this, I just click standard deviation, and now I know it's 8.1 and some change. All right, if I want to know the minimum, I can click on it. The max, the total count of numbers, the total count of values, which is different. So let me let me make the point here. Let me let me do count numbers for department, which as you can see is not numerical data. Well, there's no numbers in there, so it's zero. But if I count all the values, 1,470. You get an error if you try to take standard deviation or the variance or some other mathematical uh, summa summation of this text data here. So, interesting interesting functionality. All right, you also have the ability get the drop down here, go to more functions, and then you have a whole bunch of other options. So very powerful feature. I'm going to get out of here real quick and I don't want the total row uh, for what I'm doing today. So something else, as far as navigating your worksheet in Excel, uh, you have some hotkey options which will save you a bunch of time. So notice here I'm in row 1471 so I'm at the very bottom of my data set. If I want to go up to the top I can hold down the control key and hit the up arrow and it takes me up to the top. If I want to highlight this entire column I can hold down control shift, 
press the down arrow and now I've highlighted the whole thing. I want to go back up, I'm going to hit control up. Another option for highlighting this data, and this is an option you only have with the tables, is if I come up here uh, on F, I get this little black down arrow. If I click on it, I've just selected that entire column. Now there's over a million possible rows in any given Excel spreadsheet. I've selected all of those rows for this column. However, if I just want to select the data for this column in this table, I can, if I come up right when it turns to that black down arrow underneath the F, if I click once, I select just the data, and if I click again, I also get the header. So just to make the point, I'm going to come down here and just show you that I've only selected the data in my table. I'm not using hotkey here because I don't want to unselect it. So there you go. Alright, so I'm going to hit hold down control and use the up arrow to go up to the top. Alright, and the same thing works left and right. So if I want to go down to the bottom right, and I'm at the top left right now, I hold down control, down, right. I want to go back, so I hit I hold down control and I hit left arrow, up arrow. Let's say I want to select all the data in this data set. I hold down control shift. I'm going to go all the way across the top by hitting the right arrow and I'm going to continue to hold down control and shift and press the down arrow and I've selected all of my data. All right, I'm going to hold down control, go left right to go up to the top. All right. So one other option you have here is you can also I can select all of the entire work spreadsheet, so all 1 million rows and however many columns. If I want just the data in the table, I can use the arrow, the black arrow here. And notice if I click once, I get just the data. If I click twice, I get the data and my column labels. All right, so that's pretty powerful. Another tool that you have for selecting columns, and this is very valuable when you start writing functions, is the ability to do to do this. So. Uh, let's say I want the average number of years with current manager. Okay, so I have this here. Um, so I select a cell. I'm going to come up here to my formula input. I'm going to put it, an equal sign, which is how you tell Excel that you're about to write a formula. I'm going to write average. I'm going to press tab to open brackets. All right. Now, what I could do, and this is what people typically do, is I come here and I click and drag all the way down to the bottom. Or, alternatively, if I want to use what I just showed you, I can hold down Control Shift and go all the way to the bottom. Hit Enter. I got my value. Another way I could select, but notice how when I did that, it changed to this right here. Table data, which is what I named my table, square brackets, and then the column name. All right, so I'm going to show you how to do that yourself in a second here, but another another option would be to use this black arrow here. I want the average of just the data. I use the black arrow, I click once, hit enter, and notice again we've got table data years with current manager there. Same value. Alright. So here's your other option. I can simply start typing in the name of my table, so TBL, and notice how it comes up here. I have the option right here to just select it. So if I hit tab, it selects the entire table. Notice the whole, all the data in the table, not the columns, just data selected. Then I'm going to open up square brackets, and I have the option of either clicking to select one here, or I can start typing the column name, and it'll start filtering it down pretty powerful and then close square brackets hit enter and again 4.12 so it's a very powerful way of referencing the values in a in a table and I would also like to point out that this works across all the sheets in your workbook so if I open up another sheet down here and I still want the average of that rather than having to go to that sheet in order to select the data I can start my formula here so I typed in equals average and I've opened my brackets and I can just hit start typing table it shows up I use the tab key to select it open my square bracket tab to select close close enter and there you go so we're not really gonna have too much of a need for that here I am gonna leave this open because I'm gonna want it later as kind of a scratch sheet 
And I just want to make the point that we don't have to go back and actually select data on this worksheet in order to get our work done. All right, so enough of that. Let's actually start looking at our values. All right, so the first thing I want to do, easy thing I can do, is I want to just check for duplicates. All right, so I'm going to come up here. I'm going to select all of my data by using the diagonal down arrow for my table. I'm going to come up to the data tab and I'm going to select remove duplicates. I'm going to leave all the columns selected because I want this thing to tell me when it sees a two rows or more that are exact identical across all the columns. Now if I just wanted to remove all the duplicate you know, ages, I could do that too, but that would be kind of ridiculous. Uh, so my data doesn't have headers because I didn't select the headers, so I'm going to uncheck that. Oh, forgive me. No, I'm not. I'm going to recheck it. Notice how when I unchecked it, it selected the headers. So I'm going to leave that checked so it doesn't look at the headers. I'm going to select OK. No duplicate values found. All right, that's very good news. So that's one thing I don't really have to worry about. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go variable by variable through here, and I'm just going to look at the values that I have. All right, so here's our age. All right, so what I'm looking for here is a couple things. First of all, I'm looking for any obvious errors. Uh, I'm looking for constants. So, and I know for a fact, because I've already looked through this data before, we're going to run into a couple of variables here where there's just one value. Well, that doesn't tell you anything unique about any individual employee, right? So, for instance, let's come over here to the column over 18. So I look at all the values here by selecting the drop down and I see that the only value in this column is yes. All right, so great. Everybody in this company is over 18. Well, that's, we can, we can check in this particular case whether that's actually true by looking at the minimum value in the age column and it's 18. Okay, so this column here literally provides no information of any kind, all right? It only has one value. It's basically a constant. It's useless. So I'm going to click on the V down here. So, so not right here to select just the data in the table, but actually all the way up here to select the entire column on the spreadsheet. I'm going to right click and I'm going to select delete and bye bye. We don't need you. Okay. It's uh, not helpful. All right. Now I already know that there is one other column like that. We'll get to it in a minute. The other thing I'm looking for is blank or missing values, right? So if values are missing, I have to make decisions about what I'm going to do. Am I going to impute, as we call it, another value in there? Make a best guess, basically, about what that value should be. Um, in this particular data set, there actually are no missing values. So in future video series, I'll, I'll do analysis of data sets where we have serious data quality issues. For this particular one, it's very clean. All right, so if there were any blanks, they would show up right down here. So I'll, uh, I'll make that point here. I'm going to cut this so I still have access to it. Oh, never mind. Anyway, I'm going to delete it. It was 36, so I can redo it. All right, if I come down and select age, now I have a blank. So I'm going to click select all here to unselect everything, select just blanks, and filter it down. And now I'm just looking at that one row that has a blank value. So if this was... An issue, I would do this for each one and, and either impute value. So in this case, I would probably make this value here the average of all the other age values, just because it's my best guess. But it's not actually a problem in this data set, so I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to put that data back. Good to go. All right, attrition. Now, this is this is what we actually want to predict in the next step. Uh, we had values no and yes. Okay, great. Business travel. No blanks. And this is, it's in these text values where we sometimes in these data sets have issues where you'll see multiple values that all mean the same thing that are written differently. So if, for instance, there was a value in here that said non-travel, but it wasn't capitalized, that would show up as a totally separate class. And you would have to somehow correct that to be so that you could group everything appropriately. Again, really good, clean data set that we're working on. You're not going to have that problem in any of the uh, columns in this data set. All right, so we've got three values there. Great. Daily rate, no blanks, department, no no weird misspellings or anything like that, no blanks. And I'm just going to go through the rest of these and do the same thing. So 
So here's another variable where we basically have a constant, right? So this is useless. Employee count is useless. Doesn't tell us anything unique about any of our employees. So I'm going to come up here, use the select the I column to get rid of it. Right click, select delete. All right, employee number. Now this is an interesting one because it's just the number of the employee, right? It's useless also. Um, so now I, I know that because I know that the, the number that's arbitrarily assigned to an employee doesn't actually carry any information about who that employee is. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this too. It's not useful. Environment satisfaction. Gender. Great. Hourly rate. We're just going to keep going through these. Job role. All right, got quite a few options here. So just look through it carefully and make sure there's no obvious errors or duplications and we can see that there aren't again it's a very clean data set we'll just keep going through here oh let me go down to the bottom here make sure there's no missing values there's not You can see that this takes a little while. I mean, I'm putting a pretty. This, this is going to be a long video for the simple reason that I am going to actually show you this entire process, um, and that's largely because I want you to see me making mistakes and running into issues that I maybe can't solve immediately and having to Google it and figure it out. Because that is a common part of this process, and something that is also common in, in videos showing how to do this kind of stuff is you get the impression when you watch people do the work that. They just effortlessly know exactly what to do. And the reality is that people typically have already gone through these data sets and they already know them really well, and you're just seeing the summation, you know, kind of the summary of their work. So the reality is that actual data analysis is can be a pretty frustrating, time-consuming process, and I want you to see that. All right, so here we have another constant, right? So standard hours, everybody has 80 standard hours. Not useful. Doesn't tell us anything. So select it, get rid of it. All right, we're getting pretty close to the end here. So I'm just going to blast through it real quick. Got some interesting employee survey type information here that we can hope holds some value for our future modeling endeavors. Okay, so we can be pretty happy. All right, so we've gone through it now. There's no duplicates. We've gotten rid of three columns that were constants and one, the employee number column that just didn't add any useful value. Uh, we haven't seen any obvious errors, so that's helpful. Now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the normality of our numeric data. Now there's two ways to do this. So if you're in Excel 2016 or a later version, you can simply, so in this case I'm going to select the age data here. I'm going to go to insert and I have statistical charts right here. You won't have this option if you're using 13 or an earlier one. I'm going to show you here in a moment how to do a histogram without having a 16 or greater, but I'm going to hit the drop down here. Uh, and I have a couple options for histogram, and I can do a box and whisker plot. So I'm going to choose this histogram that has, or excuse me, I'm going to choose the histogram here. All right, so we can see that uh, this is, fairly normally distributed. And what I mean by that is it has this typical bell-shaped curve. It's a little skewed to the right, which means the tail or this downward sloping part to the right is a little bit longer than the one to the left. And that makes sense because we have a hard cutoff on the left side of 18 right here. That's the age at which our employees begin working. All right. So, but overall we have the bell-shaped curve and we have what is pretty apparently a normally distributed variable here. Now, this is important because the regression that we're going to build depends on the assumption of normally distributed variables in order to work properly. So as we go through this, we're going to see that we have some that aren't normally distributed, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to fix that without, you know, getting rid of the variable altogether. All right, so let's talk about how to do this using 13 or earlier. 
All right, so I'm going to do a little trick here just so that I can keep the age column visible. I'm going to click and hold my left mouse button down here over B, and I'm going to come all the way across to the end of the, the data set here. I'm going to right click. I'm going to select hide. Now they all go away. All right, I'm going to come up to data. You should already have the data analysis add-in enabled. If you don't, come here to file, options, add-ins. Uh, go to manage Excel add-ins and then if the analysis toolbacks are unchecked go ahead and check them hit OK and this will pop up here on the data tab uh, that should be regardless of the version of Excel that you have All right, so I want to make a histogram so I'm gonna click data analysis select histogram OK and my input range is just the data that I want to put into my histogram so for that I'm just gonna select this by clicking twice with my little black drop down or little black down arrow so now I've got my data I did include the label so I'm gonna check the labels box now I have this option bin range here and I'm not gonna do anything with that immediately because uh, I want you to see what happens when I don't so it's going to output the product here to a new worksheet and I want it to give me a chart. So normally what this does, it just gives you numbers or counts. So I do want a chart output, and I would like it to show me the cumulative percentage of the observations. So I'm going to check those two boxes and select OK. Select my chart, expand it a little bit so I can actually see what's going on. All right, so here we go. So pretty normally distributed. We have a bunch of bins, and a bin is basically what a histogram does is it establishes a bin between two different values and it counts all the values in the data that are between the, that upper and lower limit and then the value of that bin is that count number so we have 116 values here uh, in this bin for instance and we have 100 values that fall within this bin all right and again you see it's pretty normally distributed uh, we have some some weird anomalies here but nothing to be too concerned about. The thing about histograms is that uh, it's not helpful to count every value in the data set. You want to bin them at, it, you, you want your bins to be wide enough that you're getting a summary of the data and not just counting every single individual value. So I've got a ton of bins here. Now I can select the bin labels here, right click, go to format axis, and try to remember if this thing actually gives me the option of working with this. It doesn't. Okay. All right. So I'm going to delete this. In fact, I'm going to delete this entire sheet. So I'm going to come down here to the new sheet that it created to give me my output. I'm going to right click and hit delete. All right. Now, that's one way of doing it. So if you want, if you want the data analysis tool to tell you how many bins you want or figure it out on its own, you don't have to do anything. However, that's not super effective. Um, like, so typically, like I said, you want fewer bins so that you can get a better summary of the data. So let's look again at what this looks like if I do it using the newer uh, statistical chart. Right? So I'm going to select my data. I'm going to come up here to statistical charts. I'm going to do my histogram. Let's just count the bins. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All right, and if I wanted to see how many I have, I can select the data down here, right click, format axis. And you can see here in number of bins, I have 16. If I want to make that smaller number, like 10, I just enter 10, hit tab. Now I've got 10 bins. All right, and you can see that you know, we still have our histogram and it automatically adjusts. Everything's great. All right, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that here as a comparison. All right. Now I'm going to show you how to get a similar result using the, uh, excuse me, using the data analysis tool. All right, so the way to do that is you have to actually manually define what your bins are. So I'm going to create, I'm going to type bins. That's going to be the label for it. And then I want to know what the max and the min are for this data here. So I'm going to type equals max open brackets, and then I'm going to type to select so I'm going to type table data open square brackets age tab close the square bracket close curly bracket or the parentheses rather hit enter 
right? So my max age is 60. I'm gonna do the same thing here. Equal min table age 18. All right, so if I want 10 evenly distributed bins, I can just say, so equal this minus this. I'm gonna put these in parentheses, divided by 10. It's 4.2. So for my first bin, I want it to go up to the min plus this amount. And you can see that that's exactly what happened here on the histogram that was automatically created for me in Excel, right? So it starts at 18, it goes up to 22.2. If I add 4.2 to the min, I get 22.2. So I'm going to select equal min plus 4.2. And then in this next one, I'm going to select equal this value here. So 22.2 is the top of this first bin. It's the bottom of the next one, right? So I want to add 4.2 to this value to get to the top of the bin, which is 26.4. So the easy way to do that is hit equals, select that previous bin, and add 4.2. Now I should be able to just drag down. Oh, that did not work. Okay. Just kidding. All right, we got to delete this. Like I said, I want you to see me make mistakes. I think it's an important aspect of realizing what analytics is all about. All right, so I'm just going to do the same thing. Equal previous bin plus 4.2. All right, now I'm going to try and get it to repeat this pattern by selecting both of these, selecting this fill box right here and dragging down. And didn't work again. Okay, so that's frustrating, but it's okay. So I'm just going to keep doing the same thing manually, which is fantastic. <laughs> but okay. Okay. So we're fifty five point eight. Now, if I wanted to, so this is an interesting quirk of the data analysis histogram builder that I don't particularly like, but it is what it is. If I actually go all the way up to this last bin, the histogram builder always creates one last bin after the ones I've defined that it labels more that has whatever other values are, are still in the data set. Now, if I define bins all the way up to 60, that last bin will have nothing in it, and I don't particularly like that. If I leave the last bin that I want undefined, then it'll automatically create it for me. All right, so... Let's, uh, let's go ahead and create this new one, all right? So I'm going to come up to data analysis, select histogram, OK. Got my input range data. I'm going to get my bin range data by selecting or putting my cursor in bin range. I'm just going to drag and grab this. I want my labels. I want my cumulative percentage for my chart output. And I'm going to hit OK. All right, I'm going to cut this whole thing and come back here because I would like to compare them to each other. So I'm going to paste. Make this a little bit smaller. All right, so you can see they're very similar. All right, I basically got the same, same values. Notice, like I said, it created this more bin at the end. That is equivalent to the 55.8 to 60 bin that's here on this automatically generated one. Now, personal opinion, this one here, the one that's generated in the 2016 and above statistical charts options is much prettier, more attractive looking. That's just my opinion. However, you get the same exact information here. And if you wanted to come here and mess around with the formatting and make these wider or whatever and pretty it up a little bit because perhaps you want to include one of these histogram charts in a presentation, you could absolutely do that. Nothing stopping you from doing it. Uh, we're not going to go into the details of that in this particular video because it would take forever. All right, so I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of everything I have here. So delete, select, delete, delete. All right, I'm going to select column A and then come across to AF, right click, and hit unhide. That's going to give me all my data back. I'm going to delete sheet three by right clicking and selecting delete. I no longer want that. All right, so here we are. All right. All right. 
So uh, another chart that we can do, and I don't know how to do this in 2013 earlier, so if you have one of those versions, you can you can skip this part, but uh, box plots are very powerful, and if you have the ability to do them, I strongly suggest you use them. So I'm going to select my data here. I'm going to go to Insert, come back to Statistical Charts again, and I'm going to select my Box and Whisker Plot. All right, so what's powerful about box plots is it's showing you the interquartile range. So this right here, this line in the middle is the median. And this is the first the first quartile here, or excuse me, this is the second quartile and the third quartile. And these lines here show 1.5 times the interquartile range, which is this right here. Now, if nothing I just said makes sense to you, uh, go ahead and Google it. I don't want to take too much time to explain it here. Uh, I just want to make a couple couple points, or really one point. If I have outliers, which are easily defined as something that's either a value that's either greater than 1.5 the interquartile range plus the third quartile, so anything that's above this whisker, or less than 1.5 times the interquartile range uh, subtracted from the first quartile, or the second quartile, excuse me, so below here, uh, I can identify those immediately as outliers. So, easy thing here is, if I see values that are above the whiskers, which is which are these little bracket-looking guys right here, then I know I've got outliers in the data. So I don't have any outliers here, it's normally distributed. Uh, I'm pretty happy that age is, is good to go. Alright, so I don't want to go through every single one of these necessarily, because it's going to take all day. Uh, but let's look at a value that I know to be to have outliers in it which is this monthly income so I'm going to select the data here I'm going to come to insert statistical charts box and whisker and notice here I've got my my median my interquartile range and then I have a whole bunch of outliers here that are above outliers on the high side alright so I have a strong right skew in this data is what that's basically telling me and an easy way that I can just convert this to a histogram so I can see that is I can go to change chart type up here under the chart tools design tab, come to histogram, hit OK, all right, and that turns it into a histogram. So notice I've got a whole bunch of values clustered here on the left side with my peak and then a long descending tail out here to these high values. And what this is telling me is that most people make somewhere in the, you know, thousand uh, I don't know eight thousand dollar a month range in this company and a much smaller number make much larger amounts all right so it's these values out here that are the that are the outliers and the bottom line is that they're outliers because this is not normally distributed right you don't have the the bell curve you have something very different um, totally different type of distribution here okay so the problem that this presents us when we run into this is that we need or would prefer normally distributed data in order to do a regression. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to transform this data in such a way that it gives me something more closely approximating a normal distribution and gets rid of my outliers without getting rid of any data values. Alright, so I'm going to delete my chart. I'm going to show you how I plan to do that. So I'm going to click the down arrow here on the R column, right click, insert to create a new column. I'm going to title this column log underscore monthly income. Oh, having a little trouble typing. All right, there we go. Hit enter. I'm going to hit equal log. Open the function. All right, I'm just going to click over here to select. Notice the uh, bracket that it opens here at monthly income. It's saying that I'm going to do this for this whole column all the way down. So another little useful thing that Excel does for you if you have defined your data as a table. Now I'm going to close my bracket and hit enter. All right, now I've got the log of monthly income all the way down, which is awesome. All right, so let's take a look at this data and see what we have. I'm going to select it, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to visualize it as a box plot. So back to statistical charts, open a box plot. Here we go. Notice all of my outliers are now gone. Haven't gotten rid of the data. Uh, I've just taken the log of it. So I'm going to change this to a histogram by going to change chart type, histogram, OK. And now you can see that this looks a great deal more quote unquote normal. 
All right, and I can I can reduce the number of bins somewhat to make that more obvious. So I'm going to right click on my uh, X axis labels here, select format axis, number of bins. I'm going to go down to 10. Seems like a good number. Hit tab. And you can see again, so it's not perfect, but it is much closer to being normally distributed than it was before. And the beautiful thing is I didn't have to get rid of any data to do this, right? So log transformations, super useful for helping you meet the assumptions that you need to for regressions. All right, so one other thing I want to show you. I want this log value of monthly income. That's what I want to use. I do not want this column here anymore, right? Because I'm not going to use it when I do my, my modeling. But if I just delete the column by right-clicking on Q and hitting delete, all of a sudden I have all these reference errors because this thing's now pointing to a column that doesn't exist. All right, so I'm going to select undo. Easiest way to take care of that is to just select the data, right-click, copy, right-click on the first cell again, and then paste special uh, paste values, just values. Okay, what it's going to do is it's going to copy the values but not the formula, and it's just going to paste them right back on there. So when I do that, there's no longer a formula up here, right? It's just the value. I'm going to hit escape to get rid of the selection. And now when I get rid of monthly income, good to go. All right? So that's an easy way of solving that problem. And I now have a much better variable here for doing regression later on down the road. All right. So uh, another thing that you can do here is you can use you can do box plots to look at the distribution of variable variables by uh, category this is extremely useful All right, so I want to look at this monthly income again uh, based on job role okay so I'm going to select monthly income and I'm going to click twice here because I want the label and the same thing here insert box plot hmm. okay that did not work out exactly the way I'd hoped. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to select data. I'm a, so, well, let me, let me show you what I'm doing here. All right, so uh, I selected this here. I want to have a bunch of box plots, basically, one each for each of these job roles, right? So I've selected my chart. I'm going to come up here to select data, and you notice it, despite the fact that I selected both of these for whatever reason, uh, it's only doing the values by log of monthly income. I need a horizontal axis labels. All right, so I'm going to click edit here, uh, and it's going to give me the option of selecting my axis labels. I'm going to hit OK. Yep. I'm going to redo that without the uh, without the column header. All right, and OK, and now check this out. This is cool. I really like doing this. This is this is a a standard piece of my workflow when I'm doing initial exploration of my data set. So now for each of these I can look and I can see the monthly income is not distributed the same way across all these various job roles. And as you might expect, managers are very high, research directors are very high, right? The the median or the middle value of that distribution of values is a great great deal higher than, you know, for instance, a sales representative, which you would reasonably expect. Sales executive is higher than sales representative. And this this is helpful because it gives us an idea that our data has, is actually reasonable. And it's just interesting. It's also interesting to note that even though I took the log, uh, I actually do still have some outliers here. So research scientists, even taking the log, there is there are a couple outliers. We have one low outlier for lab tech. We got a bunch for the sales representatives, which is probably not too surprising. You know, if they're paid by commission, you're going to have low performers and, and really high performers that, that, you know, they're just outside that distribution pretty much no matter what. And I'm okay with that because overall, uh, I've got my monthly income normally distributed. I'm not too worried about it. But this is interesting. Uh, something else to look at that might be interesting is to, let's say I want to look at monthly income by whether people are treated or not. Is there some interesting relationship between whether somebody leaves a company and the log of their monthly income, right? So I'm just going to come up to select data again. I want to get rid of, I'm, I'm, well, I'm going to hit edit here. Backspace, just get rid of that. I'm going to come over here to attrition. I'm going to select all those values and hit OK. 
pull this over here so we can look at it. So it's interesting. We can definitely see a difference. Now, there's, there's not a, a massive difference, but then I took the log, so the differences that you might see are muted somewhat. But people that didn't leave are definitely paid more than people that did. Now, is this important? Well, it's hard to say. It may be that it's typical that new employees attrit at a much higher rate than folks that have been around longer. So if that's the case here and you would expect newer employees to be paid less, then there's a relationship here, an interesting one, but not necessarily one that's of any actual significance. Uh, and we're not going to worry about that too much here. But we'll talk about significance and all kind of stuff when we actually do the modeling, but it's interesting. Uh, so I'm going to delete this. All right, now I think I've I think I've pretty well demonstrated this whole process and how the visualization works. Uh, one other chart that I want to talk about is uh, scatter plots. So let's see. So scatter plots basically take two numeric val values. They put one on the x-axis, one on the y-axis, and then they put a dot wherever. You know, for instance, if I had distance from home on the x-axis at the value 1 with age on the y-axis at the value 41, there'd be a dot. All right, so let's just see what that looks like. All right, so I'm going to select my data here. And we're going to see if there's a relationship between distance from home and age. Okay, so I'm going to come up to insert, scatter plot. I'm going to select one. Now I have 1,470 dots here, which is a bit of a pain in the butt. <laughs> I'm going to come up to select data. So you can see there's some there's some craziness going on here. Uh, I don't know what this is, so I'm going to get rid of it. But you can see I have age here. It's, I'll be honest with you, it's not clear to me exactly what Excel is doing in this particular in this particular case. Uh, so let's try something. I'm going to get rid of age. Oh my gosh. All right, never mind. All right. So this is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about where I want you to see me run into issues and get a little confused and have to work it out. Alright, so I'm going to open up Chrome. I'm going to open up a new tab and I'm just going to Google it. Go to dummies.com. That seems appropriate since I'm feeling a little dumb right now. <laughs> So you want to select range, insert, scatter. All right, let's try something real quick. I think I know what the problem is. All right, so I got age, got distance from home. I'm holding down control so that I can select both at the same time. I'm going to go to insert scatter plot. It's taking a while for this thing to think. I'm actually asking it to do quite a bit of work. It's plotting a ton of points, so it's a challenge. All right. I'm just going to select the data here. Insert, scatter plot. There we go. All right, so it turns out the issue was that I was selecting the uh, label. So what I, so anyway, nothing to worry about. All right, so we could see, I mean, looking at this, do you, dear listener, see any pattern here? I do not. Uh, I'm going to add a chart element real quick. So I'm going to come up here to add chart element, come down to trend, trend line. All right, so I can put a linear trend line here and see if there's a linear relationship. So I'm going to click on this, and it shows up. You can see it here. It's kind of hard to see because of the color, uh, same as the point. So I'm going to right-click on it, go to Format Trend Line, and I'm just going to change the color of this thing. 
by clicking on the little paint bucket here, color, I'm going to make it red. Shows up a little bit better. And I'm going to come over here to my trend line options, and I'm going to have it display the R squared value on chart. All right, so it shows up right here. I'm going to move this little guy. All right, so what the R squared value basically means is a change in X causes, or a change in X explains some percentage of the variance in Y. Y being this set of values right here. All right. Now, basically what I'm what I'm saying here, all right, so I have age here, so a change in age explains this percentage of a change in distance from home. This 3e to the negative 06 basically means this is 0 0.000006, so 600 thousandths of a percent of the change in distance from home that age explains. So it's basically telling us is that age doesn't explain anything. So that's interesting. Now I want to show you something else. I find this fascinating in this data set. This is something I've run across multiple times and it kind of drives me crazy quite frankly. I'm going to delete this chart and I want to show you something that I think is a little inexplicable. All right, so I have hourly rate here and then I have monthly income and monthly rate which I just went right past them. <laughs> Alright, so I got well log of monthly income now and monthly rate and hourly rate. Now you might reasonably expect that hourly rate and monthly rate would be correlated at least. There'd be some relationship between them. Now I'm going to select all these columns in between them and hide them just to make my life a little easier so I can look at them right next to each other. So I just I just want to show this to you because I think it's fascinating. So I'm going to select my hourly rate and my monthly rate data. I'm going to hold down control so I can do both. I'm going to insert a scatter plot. Look at that. No obvious relationship whatsoever. All right, and if I go ahead and insert my trend line, which you can barely even see it, but I select it. I'm going to make it red so you can see it. Actually, maybe I'll make it yellow. Nope, that doesn't really show up. I'll make it red. And I'm going to come here to my trend line options, and I'm going to come down and have it display the R squared, which, again, you can barely see, so I'm going to drag it out here. Look at that, two ten thousandths of a percent. This is amazing. So what this is telling me is that there's basically no relationship at all between the hourly rate of pay and the monthly rate that these employees receive. That is that is difficult to understand. So and here's another thing. So I'm gonna delete this too. I'm gonna drag across here to select and unhide. And now let's do the same thing for monthly income and monthly rate. So I'm gonna select this, hold down control, select the monthly rate, insert. Scatter plot. Fascinating. All right. Add chart element trend line. Again, I don't see any obvious relationship here. There's a little bit of a little bit of one, maybe. I mean, there's an actual slope on this line, so that's that's interesting. But I'm gonna make it red so I can kind of see it a little bit. Come here to trend line options. Display the R squared equation, or the R squared value. Excuse me. I'm gonna bring it out here so I can see it. All right. So two thousandths of a percent. Again, basically no relationship at all between monthly rate and monthly income. Now, I don't have any explanation for that. Uh, so what I have done in the past when I have built models on this data set is I've just deleted monthly rate and hourly rate. And the last thing I wanna show you is why I typically make that decision. All right, so we already looked at the log of the monthly income or excuse me, we already looked at monthly income and how in its just its raw values we have that really long tail distribution. That's a pretty typical distribution for for income. Income's rarely is it's very rare that income is fairly distributed. Often there's a few high paid individuals that make a lot more than the vast majority of the employees. So that's pretty normal. Now if I look at the distributions of hourly rate and monthly rates, so I'll start with hourly rate, I'll go to insert, make myself a histogram. I can see that there's there's no obvious distribution here at all. This is basically a uniform distribution, which means you get the same values for every bin. That does, quite frankly, it just doesn't make sense. All right. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna change this to monthly rate so I can look at the same thing. Instead of deleting this and then selecting it separately, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here to select data. I'm gonna remove series one. I'm gonna hit add. I'm gonna come up here and select monthly rate. 
the month of rate data. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to cut and paste that here. Oh, my gosh. All right. Okay, so series name, monthly rate, series values. I'm going to select my values here. Hit OK. There you go. Another uniform distribution. That just doesn't make obvious sense. I'm going to tell you, it's my personal opinion that since this is a synthetic data set, it was created artificially by simulation, I think the monthly income makes sense, but that the hourly and monthly rate just simply don't. All right, and for that reason, when I'm doing this analysis, I typically get rid of these just to increase what is, in my opinion, the realism of the results. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here. So I'm going to delete hourly rate. I'm going to delete monthly rate. All right. All right. The last thing we're going to do before we, before we close this video up is I'm going to demonstrate how to encode all these variables. So uh, these mathematical algorithms that we're going to be using to actually build our model in the next video require the input data to be numeric, right? So for attrition here, for instance, this is going to be the target of my algorithm. It's going to be trying to predict yes or no. Uh, but my math equation does not know what the actual mathematical value of yes is, right? So uh, what you need to do is encode this into something that actually makes sense, all right? So I'm going to show what that looks like for a couple of these columns just so you can get an idea. So I'm going to create a new column here by right clicking on C and hitting insert. And then I'm going to name this column. So I'm going to name this column left as in the employee left. And then I'm going to put a formula here that returns a one if the employee left or if this equals yes and a zero if they stayed or attrition is no. Okay. So if you follow along here, I'm going to type equals if open brackets. I want I need a logical test here. So my logical test is does this equal and then double quotation marks. Yes. Comma. The next argument is what is the value I want this function to give me if it does this test and it finds that this value does equal yes. Well, I want it to give me a one, so I'm going to put a one, comma, and the value I want it to return if it if it's not yes is zero. So I'm going to type a zero, close my brackets, hit enter. There you go. I've now encoded this variable. Now we have the same problem here, where if I delete this, it's going to screw this thing all up. I'm going to get all these reference areas. So I'm going to undo. So same deal here. I'm just going to select all of my data, right click, copy, right click on this first cell and, in, and uh, paste values only. All right, I'm gonna hit escape to get rid of the selection and now I'm gonna get rid of this attrition column. All right, so this is, this is what I want right here. Now, the other thing I need to do is just in order to make, in order to feed this data into my algorithm later on, I need this column to be the rightmost column in the data set. I'm gonna close this real quick. So I'm gonna cut this column and I'm just gonna put it over here. Excuse me, that did not work. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna hit control, hold down control shift, go down, copy, come over here, up to the top, control V or paste. All right, you notice this is something else that's wonderful about tables. Notice how it extended the table. It's a very, very useful feature. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of this column altogether because I have it over on the right side now. I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna change the column name, and I'm good to go. All right, let's look at another example. All right, so we have travel rarely. It's not a mathematical value, obviously, so I need to change it. So I'm going to rename this business travel numeric. And let's look at the unique values that we have under business travel. All right. So we have non-travel, people that don't travel at all, people that travel frequently, and people that don't travel very much at all. Now, we can encode this by saying that these values actually have a natural progression, right? So non-travel is less than 
travel rarely, which is less than travel frequently. So it's meaningful if we encode these values as 0, 1, and 2, where non-travelers are 0, travel rarely is 1, travel frequently is 2. Now, that won't hold up if when I get over here and I encode this, which is the next thing I'm going to do, there is no such natural sequential relationship between these three things here. These are nominal values, which means they're just the names of things. There's no obvious inherent relationship between them. So we're going to encode these values very differently from the way we encode these. But these are ordinal, which means that these values are ordinal, which means that they actually have a meaningful inherent ranking, basically. Or they can be ordered, which is why they're ordinal. All right. So what we can do here is we can write another function, another if statement that captures uh, that captures that relationship. So I'm gonna I'm up here, my first empty cell. I'm gonna hit enter if open my bracket. My first logical test is does this equal non-travel? So double quotation marks, non-travel, close that. If it does, I want it to return as the value zero. If it doesn't, I still want, I need another if statement to distinguish between those who travel rarely and those who travel frequently. So I'm going to open another if function here. So I'm gonna type if again, open my brackets. I'm gonna select this value again. And now I'm gonna ask, is that value equal to travel rarely? If it is, I want it to return one. If it's not, the only option that remains is that the value that it found is travel frequently. I already returned a zero for non-travel, a one for travel rarely. So the only value left that it could possibly be is travel frequently. So if both of these are false, I want it to return a two. Now I'm gonna close both of my parentheses. So I need two of them here. I'm gonna hit enter and there you go. And again, typical thing here, I'm gonna select all this copy, paste values, escape, and I'm going to get rid of this all together. All right, so that's gone. All right, so this is the last thing I'm going to demonstrate. Right? Now, when you see me open up the next video, you're going to see that all of these values are numeric, but I'm not going to inflict on you the process of watching me actually go through the process of making all of these numeric because it'll take another 20 minutes to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to demonstrate how to do this and I'm going to talk about what the appropriate way is to encode the remainder of these that have text values and then I'll leave it to you to do it yourself and then I'll show you when we get to the next video what I ended up with. Alright, so effectively what we want here, we've got three departments, human resources, research and development, and sales. And what we want, what we want is a separate column for each of them that is a one if the employee is in that department and a zero if they're not. All right. Now, I've only got three values here. I could just come up here and write them out. I want to show you something that I think is kind of neat. Uh, it's handy. So I'm going to select all these values here. I'm going to right click, copy. I'm going to come over here to my scratch worksheet. I'm going to right click and paste. I've got them all selected. I'm going to come up here to data, remove duplicates. Uh, my data does not have a header, all right, so I'm going to leave that unchecked. I'm going to hit OK. And it took me down to just the three values that I have remaining. Now, I can either, one easy way to do this is I could simply take these and drag them like this, and now I've got my, now I've got my columns. So that would work. Or something that I think is kind of neat is I can select the number of cells across that I want to transpose these two, or to so to transpose is to take these and turn them into columns here. So I've selected three here. I'm going to come up here and type in enter, transpose. I'm going to select my array, and now I'm going to hold down control, shift, enter. All right? That's an array function. An array function puts values in multiple cells effectively. You notice that I have curly brackets around it and that's how you know that it's an array function. All right, so now I've got that. That's, I think, kind of neat. Uh, it'll be more useful, for instance, on 
this here because there's, I think, seven or nine values here. Uh, and you don't have to do it this way. It'd be totally legit if you just dragged them across. But anyway, so I've, I've got my values here now. So I'm just going to copy these. I'm going to come over here. Now I can either, to create the columns I need, I can either just right click and hit, oh, excuse me. Let's get rid of the copy because it's going to want to insert. So I can either just insert three times, which I don't, would totally legitimate. Or this is kind of a cool trick. I can select three columns, right click and hit insert, and then it'll make three new columns. So that's kind of cool. So I'm going to come over here to sheet one. I've already got them selected. I'm going to copy. I'm going to come over here and paste control V. Oh, now it doesn't want to let me do it because it's an array. All right. So I'm going to paste values. You drive me crazy. Now I'm going to select them. Now I'm going to come over here and put them in here. All right. I'm, I know I'm making this harder than it has to be, but I want to show you all the functionality that is available here. All right. So now for each of these, I'm simply going to encode. So for sales, I want a one here if the employee is in the sales department and a zero if they're not. So pretty easy. I'm going to type and equals if this equals. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> All right, equals if this equals the column header, which is sales, or I could just type uh, double quotation mark sales if I wanted to, then return one, if not zero, close, hit enter, and there we go. Okay, and then I can do the same thing for this. Same thing for this. And there you go. Now I'm going to select everything. So I dragged across. I'm going to hold down Control Shift and press the down arrow. Control C to copy. Control up arrow to come up to the top. And I'm going to right click here on this top left cell and paste values. Hit escape. Now I've got my values there. I can get rid of this. All right. Now, we need to do the same for the rest of these. So here's something uh, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this video here in a moment. What I would like you to do if you want to continue to follow along with this is you need to come through and encode the remainder of these variables. And actually, before you do that, one more note. All right. So I have three departments here. Now, by process of elimination, I can say if an employee is not assigned to re research and development, or human resources, they must be assigned to the sales department. Or I could say, if an employee is not assigned to the sales department or research and development, they must be assigned to human resources. Now, the takeaway from that is that basically one of these columns is unnecessary. Uh, I can arrive at, I, I can figure out one of these values by a combination of the other two. And that means it's redundant. It's actually not carrying any additional information to have all three columns. So best practice when you do what I just did, which is you take a nominal variable like this and you encode it across columns, is to drop one of those columns. And the typical thing, although there's no particular reason it has to be this particular column, but the typical thing is to drop the first column. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to delete the sales column. We don't need it. All right, now I just want you to take my word for that if that doesn't make sense. Basically, the bottom line is if this is zero and this is zero, I know that the person's in the sales department. All right, so I don't actually need to explicitly state in my data set that that individual's in the sales department for the sake of doing my modeling later on, okay? All right, so for the rest of these, uh, something I'd like to talk about real quick is make sure when you're encoding these that you think about whether the data is nominal or ordinal, all right? So if it's ordinal, it'll have a natural ordering. So if I come here to education field, there's no natural ordering here. Human resources isn't inherently more important or better than marketing, which isn't inherently more important or better than other or technical degree or whatever. Uh, it's non non-issue here because I only have two values, so you're just going to pick one to encode as a one and one to encode as a zero. The typical thing here is to encode male as one and female as zero. If 
you don't like that or think it's biased somehow, then do it the other way. It doesn't really matter. Just encode it however you see fit. All right. Job rule. Same thing. No natural ordinal pattern here. So this is nominal. So you're going to need to convert this to columns and then get these binary values, ones or zeros, for each column according to what's here and then delete the first column or delete one of the columns because again you don't need them all same thing goes for education field same thing goes for marital status again yeah I mean you may have an opinion about what the inherent ordering of these is whether being divorced is better than being married is better than being single or whatever however there is actually no inherent relationship so again these are these are nominal very nominal values here this is an easy one it's just yes or no so uh, yes will be a 1, no will be a 0. Too easy. And then once you've done that, you are done. And your data set will be ready to go on to the next step, which is modeling. So make sure you save. Uh, and after I close this video, I'm going to go through and, and finish the process of encoding these variables, just like I just said. And we'll talk briefly about that when we start the next video where we actually do the modeling for this data set. But I thank you for joining me. This is probably going to be the longest, certainly one of the longest videos in this series, and I appreciate you taking the time to walk through this with me. And again, if you have any questions or, or comments, feel free to comment either on the YouTube channel under the video or go to our social media pages uh, at People Analytics Alaska groups on either LinkedIn or Facebook and engage with us there. Thank you for listening. Happy learning.